So yeah, so the the final talk before lunch, we'll move into the thematic of the future of exploration, and here we'll have Toral uh, Bosoni from IEA will present to us on the oil and gas and the energy transition. Energy transition. Toral is originally from Stavanger, actually, um, and she's now the head of the oil and markets division at the Paris-based International Energy Agency, where she's been tracking uh, international oil market developments for over two decades. So she's definitely well placed to uh, talk to us about the energy transition. So with that, Toral, I'll um, give the word to you and uh, yeah, look forward to your talk. Thank you very much uh, and good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I've been looking into some of the presentations uh, that that we already had, and obviously I'm going to take a, a bigger, I'm going to step back a bit um, from the very detailed, um, um, let's see if I can share my screen, uh, and, and take a broader view on where we see at the IEA uh, the outlook for oil and gas, energy in general, over the coming decades. Um, as our uh, moderator just said, I'm following the oil markets short, medium term, um, but today I will be talking mostly about our recent report, the World Energy Outlook, uh, net zero uh, by 2050 report, uh, and going through some of the issues where we where we are there. So, uh, so before I get started, um, I want to just um, and, and look at the the, um, the outlook for oil and gas uh, and energy. I, I want to start to give you a little bit of context. Um, so, of course, the economic recovery that we're seeing um, currently post-COVID is putting oil and gas, uh, coal markets, power markets under strain. Uh, in 2021, we estimated that the increase in global coal demand was the largest ever increase in oil demand uh, last year, the biggest for, that we saw for the last 50 years. We're seeing very sharp prices uh, in um, energies, all forms of energy, oil, gas, um, power, coal. Uh, and really what we're seeing is that the supply chain, energy affordability are strained. Uh, we had a lot of weather-related factors uh, last year, everything from wo low water availability, hydropower, we've seen this in Norway, uh, calmer wind conditions in the European continent. We're seeing coal being affected in Asian countries. Um, so, so this is having a large implications for energy and, and have been a big part to driving up energy prices in recent months and getting us to where we are today. But at the same time, so what we're seeing is that a new energy economy is emerging. Uh, we're still seeing wind, solar, electric vehicles setting records. Uh, in installation, capacity, uh, generation. Uh, but the shadow of the pandemic is still looming large on the energy sector. Um, and this has had implication on progress on energy access across the world and so serves as a warning sign, an indicator that uh, the world needs to stay committed to sustainable energy transition, even when uh, we're uh, faced with volatility and bumpy roads. So at the same time, climate ambitions have never been higher than they are, they are today. Um, but what we are seeing, energy uh, data, emissions data, do not match the rhetoric. Um, very ambitious targets set uh, as of October when we published our uh, World Energy Outlook. About 70% of global emissions were covered by net zero ambitions targets, and we have seen further announcements since then. At the same time, emissions are rebounding. Energy demand is growing very strongly, uh, and um, we're looking at record uh, emissions um, uh, levels. So what the, the World Energy Outlook reports uh, is trying to do is looking to see how the energy transformation is affecting the energy sector, uh, where are we heading? Uh, how it will this change if country meets the announced pledges uh, that they have set out? How can we? How can the world keep the door open for the 1.5 degree scenario um, that was outlined uh, by our net zero roadmap uh, published last year? And also look at some of the opportunity and benefits uh, that lie along the way. So with that, I will just. Um, 
see where we are in terms of emissions. Uh, over the past 20 years, global CO2 emissions have risen substantially. And before the, pa the Paris Climate Summit, uh, it, our expectations were very clear. We saw continued growth in demand for fossil fuels, uh, coal, gas, oil, uh, and emissions are rising out to 2050. So uh, the studies that we've done, that others have done, um, uh, concluded that this would lead to catastrophic levels of global warming, around 3.5 degrees to, to 2100. Uh, but now a different picture are emerging in the energy sector. This is um, thanks to new policies uh, coming out of the Paris Agreement, new technologies uh, and cost reduction for those um, technologies, and also the economic impact from the pandemic. So our stated policy scenario that does include uh, legislated policy and regulatory targets are seeing global emissions uh, peak around uh, mid-decade 2026 and a slow decline thereafter. But that still shapes, uh, so this would shave about one degree of the projections to 2,100 uh, warming levels from 3.5 to 2.6. Um, but without substantially scaling up the ambitions, we're still facing unacceptable risk. 2.6 is too high and lead to massive uh, climate damages around the world. So we can also look and see what the net zero pledges uh, that that have uh, been made would mean. Um, so if we're looking just at the targets that were made uh, ahead of the Glasgow meeting, COP26, uh, we can see that if the net zero pledges uh, that were in place by then were implemented in full, it will lead to substantial change in the emissions pathway compared to the uh, stated policy scenario. So, and in recent months, we have seen more pledges being made, uh, India, Russia, Brazil, and others. And we've seen more than 100 countries signing up to reduce methane, uh, the global methane pledge. So our latest assessment is that the combined effect of these new uh, pledges and the methane pledge would lead to a temperature rise of around 1.8 degree. And this is the first time that governments have come forward and set targets that uh, have sufficient ambitions to hold global warming uh, to below two degrees Celsius. So obviously uh, this has huge implications for the energy sector um, and um, and the difference on where we see where the policies in place today, the legislation, where it take us and looking at what what it will mean if the announced pledges are implemented in full. So just uh, to put um, to put here in, in context, we're seeing in, our, in the stated policy scenario, global oil demand will continue to increase uh, already this year. We expect it to, uh, to oil demand. Uh, to exceed the levels before the pandemic uh, and increase uh, towards 2030. Natural gas by 2030 is about 15 percent higher than, than it was in 2020. At the same time, output from solar PV and wind will triple over the next decade. Uh, we grow to, in as many as 130 countries. And the increase that we see in global electricity demand growth over the period uh, will be met uh, about three quarters of, of the electricity demand growth that we expect can be met um, with output from clean energy uh, and power. So, but if we look at what it means uh, and how the announced pledges would change the picture for energy going forward, and if we just assume that the pledges made up into the run-up to COP are implemented, it will be enough to shape, to reshape the energy markets. So for oil, uh, maybe most of interest uh, here, we're seeing that demand uh, will flat would peak by 2025 and then flatten. Most of this is due to new to increased sales of electric vehicles. Uh, today, EVs account for about 5% of global car sales uh, by 2030. Uh, if the announced, according to the announced policies, uh, that number will rise to 30%. So this comes about uh, by a change by car manufacturing, we're changing their business models, uh, and a policy push by countries and cities uh, setting up targets to stop 
the sale of electric vehicles, uh, of internal combustion engine vehicles, and really push uh, electric vehicles on the road. So for natural gas, we see a similar picture. Demand uh, reached a maximum level soon after 2025 and then flattens going forward. Um, two key reasons for this, gas use in the power sector uh, and in buildings. Um, these two uses for gas um, collectively account for about 60% of gas use today. They will go into structural decline if the policies uh, and targets have been announced are implemented. So uh, for power, natural gas will lose market share with the growing role of, of solar, PV and wind. In buildings, uh, introduction of performance standards, uh, efficiency improvements uh, means that get less gas will be needed. And in terms of uh, solar, PV and wind, uh, the announced pledges would accelerate the uptake uh, of, of these energy sources uh, and by 2030, uh, we see the solar PV and wind capacity uh, additions would reach nearly 500 gigawatts, and that's double the levels that we see today. So the growth of solar PV and wind will keep up with the growth in electricity demand over the next decade, uh, and leading to an increase in the share of generation from about 10% today to 30% in the announced pledges sc scenario. Uh, that also means that uh, generation from solar PV and wind will overtake both natural gas and coal um, by the end of this de decade. So quite significant changes uh, to the uh, landscape for energy um, if, um, if governments uh, are serious uh, about the pledges that they made uh, for energy and climate emissions um, in the coming years. So moving on. Um, so now achieving the net zero pledges as announced uh, in the uh, announced pledges scenario would more move markets, but I think it's important to put uh, put this into context. So first of all, we cannot take for granted that governments will implement their pledges on time and in full. We're seeing that uh, uh, currently, and as pledges have not yet been backed up by credible and uh, policies uh, or that will be implemented uh, and this will be needed um, for, for this scenario to play out and to make them a reality. So second, um, the pledges themselves, even if they were implemented in full, they do not put the world on track uh, for 1.5 degree stabilization in global uh, temperatures. So for a full delivery of the announced pledges would only cl close 30% uh, of the gap uh, by 2030 um, to reach uh, this, the, the, the 1.5 degree pathway. So now moving on to the next slide. So another way to look at these changes for the energy si system is to consider sort of the implications for international trade. Uh, for the moment, oil is really uh, dominating uh, international trade and energy. Um, but you can see in this chart that we have added some new elements uh, to our trade metrics. Uh, and this is, ma is mainly due to new work that we have done on the role of critical minerals going forward. So now we're tracking critical minerals in the energy sector uh, systematically. Um, and for the moment, you can see here we have critical minerals accounted for 11% of international trade in 2019. Most of this uh, is uh, due to copper used for electricity grid and other electric applications. But if we look and see what happens in the announced pledges scenario, we see that oil still retains a predominant role. Uh, although the pattern of trade by 2050 are quite different, um, some of the importers of today, including the European Union and China, will cut their consumption and imports uh, if they implement uh, their policies. Uh, and by 2050, most more than uh, half of the trade in oil goes from the Middle East to developing countries in Asia. So, so this means that uh, we have new uh, trade um, considerations uh, and um, obviously implications for political relationships around oil going forward. 
Um, but we can also see that there's some new uh, energy sources uh, in the matrix, and this is hydrogen we're seeing coming up uh, as, a, as a growing, uh, taking a growing share of international trade. In the, um, and yeah, I wanna get to my next one, click here. Um, and in the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, uh, we're seeing that um, the uh, current dynamics of international energy trade are completely overturned. Here we see that hydrogen and critical minerals uh, taking up a much larger share, 80% of global trade. Uh, among the critical minerals, we're seeing uh, increased demand for lithium, nickel, cobalt, rare earths, copper. And this is raising important questions for us at the International Energy Agency and globally about the adequacy and geographical diversity of supply. So, let me see here. And for some of the key technologies, critical mi minerals already uh, comprise a very large share of the overall cost uh, of that technologies. Here, we're just looking at uh, the share of the minerals in the overall cost. And we're seeing, for example, that in batteries, even though they're much cheaper than they were five years ago, uh, raw materials now account for about 50 to 70 percent of the total battery cost. This poses risk um, to, to the outlook. We've seen prices rise for a number of critical minerals this year. Uh, and of course, if you look at take this in isolation, it could lead to an increase in prices for a number of the key uh, clean energy technologies uh, that will be needed to meet uh, the climate ambitions um, towards 2050. And in fact, in 2021, it might be the first year where the cost of solar panels does not fall uh, because, because of the rise of mineral cost. So the conclusion sort of of this analysis is the trade uh, patterns, producer policies, uh, geopolitical considerations um, uh, will have will change dramatically over the next decades as the energy uh, markets are transitioning into uh, lower emissions world. So now I want to go over uh, and talk a little bit more about oil and gas. Um, obviously, the uncertainties about the demand uh, means um, a dilemma for producers, producing countries, companies. Uh, and as the trajectory for oil and gas demand varies across the scenarios, uh, it, always, it also has implications for the investment required to ensure adequate supplies. Uh, this is for development, but also for exploration uh, activities, which I'm sure uh, is very uh, uh, dear to, to this group of, um, uh, of uh, participants. So in the steps, in the stated policies scenario, we're seeing that annual upstream investment will average about 650 billion US dollars from 2021 to 2030, slightly higher th than that towards 2050, and that's higher than the average investment levels that we saw in uh, the previous decades. Uh, but if we if we go and look um, and and see what the announced pledges scenario means for investments and the outlook for oil and gas, uh, we're seeing that the investment required uh, to develop new fields are already. Uh, much lower. Average annual upstream investment would need to average about 500 billion between 2021 and 2050. And this is um, pledges that have been made by governments uh, towards uh, their climate targets. So now, but if we look at the net zero uh, emissions by 2050 scenario, in this scenario, demand for oil and gas would plummet uh, to levels that would not require new field developments beyond those that are already approved. Uh, investment in existing fields will continue, and we see uh, in the roadmap that we have laid out on how the world could uh, move to reach the net zero emissions targets globally, um, average investments uh, that were required um, will be around 230 billion on average uh, and about a two thirds lower than the in the stated policies scenario. So clearly um, big variations of um, in, in the outlook for, for oil and gas, depending on uh, how the policy framework 
uh, uh, looking at the implications for investments going forward. So now looking at where we are today, um, obviously at the IEA for many years, um, we warned about the potential mismatch in investments, oil and gas supply, investment in clean energy technologies, um, security of supply is obviously one of the IEA's core mandates. And what we're seeing in the markets today, uh, these warnings are becoming realized. In the case of oil and gas, upstream investment is half what it was in 2014, uh, primarily due to the sharp drop in prices in 2015 and again in 2020 uh, caused by COVID. Uh, and while the industry is obviously um, able to do more with less today, um, with upstream operations, much more leaner, more efficient, uh, today's oil and gas investment uh, appears to be geared towards a future where consumption of oil and gas is stagnant or even declined. So if I look um, at the, the investment levels that we saw in uh, 2020 that we estimate for 2021, we're still waiting for uh, annual reports to be published uh, to confirm this 2021 numbers. But what we're seeing today is that the investment levels are very well aligned to the investment required to meet a net zero trajectory uh, to 2030. So if we look at the other side of the picture, um, clean energy uh, investment technologies, spending on these uh, already picking up, much more resilient in 2020 than oil and gas spending. And we're expecting to see an increase we estimate that there was an increase also in 2021 and continued gains in the coming years. Uh, but we're still well out of line with what would be needed uh, to need to reach uh, net zero uh, emissions uh, trajectories. And in that investment in clean energy uh, technology would need to triple from the levels that we saw last year. So. <clears throat> Uh, the mismatch that you're looking at on the screen, that's obviously creating risk for the future. If you don't have a boost in, uh, in investment in clean energy technologies, then we cannot have uh, the very low level of, of investment on the left-hand side um, and still maintain reliable energy supplies. So obviously um, the IEA is uh, advocating for a boost in clean energy investment across all technologies and markets but while we have this imbalance uh, in investment on the oil and gas side on the one hand clean energy technologies on the other hand we're seeing that there's a strong risk of further price swings and increased volatility uh, in energy markets so now before um, closing up, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, traditional oil and gas operations. Um, and as we see, um, uncertainty about the future is creating many uh, challenges for the industry. Uh, but at the IEA, we don't think that this is a reason for companies to wait and see uh, as they consider their strategic choices. So first and foremost, uh, we think that minimizing emissions from, from core oil and gas operations should be a first priority for all companies, whatever the transition pathway is. So we see many uh, cost effective opportunities to bring down emissions intensity of oil and gas operations, uh, such as minimizing flaring of associated gas, minimizing venting, CO2, tackling methane emissions, integrating renewables and low carbon electricity, um, and we think that about 15% of global energy related uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from the process of getting oil and gas out of the ground and to consumers. So by reducing methane leaks to the atmosphere uh, is the single most important and cost effective way for the industry to bring down those emissions. Um, so, so this is uh, something that we are um, pushing for and we're seeing now many countries around the world uh, stepping up efforts in this, this area. So in the step scenario, we see uh, no major change in the global uh, emissions intensity 
uh, to 2030. Um, but in contrast, in the net zero, uh, in the net zero pathway, the emissions intensity of all production falls by about 65 percent to 2030. So quite uh, substantial reductions in um, emissions needed, required um, from the industry to meet those net zero targets. So now turning to some of the key technologies uh, where oil and gas industry could play a role uh, in energy transitions, uh, I want to start talking about carbon capture utilization and storage. Obviously, we're seeing uh, Norway taking a very important role here. And uh, today we're seeing the three quarters of the uh, CO2 capture today uh, in large scale facilities from oil and gas operations. Uh, and the industry accounts for about one third of overall spending on CCUS projects. But the volumes captured today are tiny compared to what happens in the announced policy scenario or net zero emissions uh, targets. In the APS deployment in 2030 reaches around 350 uh, million tons of CO2 um, for, per year by 2030. In the net zero emissions target deployment reaches almost 1.8 gigatons by 2030. So while we've seen that the investment uh, environment for CCUS has improved in many places, uh, significant policy support uh, emerging in Canada, Europe, the United States and elsewhere, challenges to investment remain. Um, this uh, results about contractual arrangements across uh, the chains of, car of capture and transport to storage, need for regulatory framework, uh, and so forth. And the challenges are amplified in emerging markets and developing economies where the majority of the capacity uh, is located um, in the net zero emissions world. So, but we think that industry and governments need to work together uh, to create the business model for CCUS uh, to bring around the level of deployment that will be required. So the final technology that I want to talk about is hydrogen. Um, Today, there are 17 governments that have published the low carbon hydrogen strategies and more than 20 countries uh, are in the process of developing them. And this strategy focuses mainly on supply, but attention uh, is increasingly being paid uh, to the policy needed to stimulate demand for hydrogen, both for low carbon hydrogen, hydrogen based liquids, ammonia, methanol, synthetic liquids uh, with low emission intensity. Um, and on the basis of current policy and the steps, only a small increase in low carbon hydrogen and hydrogen based fuels uh, to 2030 is expected. But in the APS and, and the net zero uh, scenario, demand is picking up much more uh, rapidly and it it's used to provide flexibility in the power sector, replace existing uses of hydrogen, and some new end uses uh, emerge in transport, heating and buildings, and so forth. Uh, in the net zero emissions scenario, half of the low carbon hydrogen produced in 2030 is from electrolysis, and half is from coal and natural gas equipped from CCUS. Um, this ratio varies considerably uh, across countries. Uh, and we're seeing that although many uh, countries can produce low carbon hydrogen, the cost is varying widely around, around the world, which is why also we see that um, trade and hydrogen um, expected to pick up very sharply in the coming years. So, um, so I just want to, to finish uh, up by, uh, let's see, my last slide. Uh, so we're seeing that the transformation on the energy sector uh, is obviously uh, motivated by the fight against climate change, um, but that doesn't mean uh, that all of the benefits are environmental. We, we see also huge commercial industrial employment gains uh, and for those that make the leap to the new global energy economy. So if we get on track uh, to net zero emissions by 2050, uh, there's market opportunity for manufacturers of clean energy equipment uh, that are simply huge. If we just look at technologies such as wind, solar panels, lithium-ion batteries, electrolyzers and fuel cells, 
these five markets uh, in the net zero emissions uh, scenario would reach a comparable size uh, to today's oil market by the mid-century. So this is obviously creating enormous uh, prospect opportunities for companies uh, that are positioned um, along a growing set of global supply chains. So with that, I'll end my uh, my presentation. Uh, I, I realize that there is um, two minutes uh, until lunch. So um, I'm happy to take one question or two. Um, and obviously, if um, a lot of numbers, a lot of information, happy to take questions, uh, you can send email uh, that I can forward to uh, also the teams that are working more in detail on the technology roadmaps, on the scenario buildings uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation, and uh, no, there's a lot of questions coming uh, <laughs> on this. So, uh, yeah, well, it'll be hard pushed just to pick one, but let's let's just pluck one pluck one out. Um, okay, so we have a uh. lot of long questions as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's take one on on this. Uh, critical minerals actually. So could you comment on the possible impact that limitations in access to critical min minerals and side effects linked to the extraction may have on the need, the needed rise of clean energies? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, thank you. It's a very good question and, and it's something that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at, we've just published a report last year on the role of cr critical and minerals are playing in, in the energy transition. Obviously, I mean, I tried to illustrate uh, the increase uh, in the critical minerals, different minerals. Uh, and what we looked at in the report is sort of the concentration uh, in production on the supply side for these minerals. Um, the report is available online. Uh, you can see now countries, some member countries, our associate member countries, obviously uh, concerned that the supply chain will be dominated with only a few uh, players, right? And can we, is investment coming forward? Uh, what does it mean if, invest, if enough investment uh, into the critical animals are not um, uh, coming into place? What does it mean? Does it stall? Can we not produce all the electric vehicles that, that we need? Uh, all the, the wind, uh, will the cost uh, of these technology increase? And we're already seeing this. So a lot of countries around the world are, are setting up roadmaps on, on how to deal with some of the uncertainties. Where can we look to develop uh, responsibly sustainable new uh, sources for the critical minerals and how can we ensure that we can have adequate supplies uh, that would not put the transition on hold, right? Yeah. So I don't know if that an answered uh, the questions. So, good. No, I think it has. And then uh, I'm going to just pick one that has a few likes here if we can squeeze one more in. Um, so there's nothing mentioned on the need for nuclear power to meet the ambitions. Has this been considered as an option or is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is. It is in our roadmap, even in our net zero uh, emissions um, by 2050 roadmap. Nuclear plays uh, a very important role. Um, we don't see uh, that reaching the net zero emissions uh, possible without uh, having nuclear, even though in many countries this is being phased out for, for, for many different reasons. Uh, lifetime um, retirement of, uh, of nuclear power plants are coming to retirement, but we're seeing now an increasing interest in, in nuclear uh, generation as a solution to meet uh, net zero. Um, renewable energies obviously very uh, important and will be, be meeting the majority of, of demand growth and electricity going forward. Uh, and as, but as our economy is electrifying, the increase in electricity is just enormous, right? Uh, and when, with the um, variability of, of uh, renewable energy, when the sun is not shining, when the wind is not blowing, it's very important to have sort of this base load 
uh, that can meet the peak in, in demand. Uh, obviously, storage is also playing an important role. And the IEA is, is looking now to publish a special report on nuclear in 2022. It is one of the areas that we're looking at. Also, uh, smaller modular nuclear reactors, how that can help uh, countries transitioning. Obviously, I didn't also talk talk so much about coal, but coal is really the elephant in the in the room uh, to transition and reduce emission without dealing with coal and access to electricity in in countries that are are have very strong economic growth and where not everybody has access to electricity. It's very tricky. So we're looking to see um, also how nuclear will play a role alongside. Uh, uh, renewable energies uh, to meet those targets. Excellent. OK, well, thank you again for sharing your insights and um, yeah, a really nice presentation. Definitely makes us think. <laughs> but then, yeah. uh, as I said, there's a, there's a number of questions in the uh, in the chat, so maybe if you have some minutes, you could potentially respond to a few of those. That'd be greatly uh, I'll try appreciated. to copy them over and uh, I see. No, I'll, I'll try to do that. So, so thank you very much for the time. And as as you said, more raising maybe more questions uh, than answers. But yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that that's where we are in a lot of things now. When you see that uh, we are clearly seeing governments scaling up ambitions. Now uh, we'll see what that means in reality and what the implications are for energy. Uh, but now also seeing if the policies uh, and the changes uh, to meet those submissions uh, will be um, coming um, in time. So anyway, thank you very much. And oh, thank you. Have a nice lunch, everybody. Yes, and and you. Yeah, so with that, we uh, we roll into the lunch break now. So um, the plan is to regather at one o'clock. And then we'll move into the challenging oil session. So again, thanks everyone for their participation this morning and engagement. And uh, we'll see you all at one.